Halo Dewan. Hai Bro. Halo. Hai. Oke, okay, so very good. So today we will uh we be the last week for this uh month subject the international management. Uh also we will cover a bit of the international business also. Right? Okay, yeah. So is any question before we start? Okay, yeah, so no question, right? So I think we can uh, we can start tonight's session. And as usual, if any question, you can post it to the chat. Okay. The economies of the world are at different stages of development. Some countries, such as the United States and Western European countries, have highly developed economies that have created a great amount of wealth for its citizens. Other countries, such as countries of Sub-Sahara Africa, are quite underdeveloped compared to the U.S., and large parts of their populations live in poverty. The World Bank was initially created to help with economic development. It was originally formed shortly after World War II in an effort to rebuild the economies of war-torn countries. But its mission is now global in scope. The general mission of the World Bank is to provide long-term financing for economic development. The World Bank is actually comprised of two institutions, the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, or IBRD, which provides low-interest and no-interest loans to developing countries who cannot get financing elsewhere. The IBRD also provides technical and research assistance to developing countries. Examples of projects funded by these loans include infrastructure projects such as power plants, roads, railroads, ports, telecommunication, and water systems. Loans have also been provided for health, education, and debt relief. As you can probably see, these types of projects are foundational for further economic development. For example, if you don't have a healthy, educated population with access to roads, power, safe water, and communications, you will not have significant economic development. The IBRD has about 188 member nations, which is pretty close to every nation on the planet. A country must pay a subscription to join. Each member country gets 250 votes and can get more votes by buying shares of the IBRD at $100,000 per share. Decisions are made by majority vote, but the largest shareholders can control the outcome because they have most of the votes. The U.S. is the largest shareholder. The other part of the World Bank is the International Development Association, or IDA. The IDA was started in 1960. It works with the IBRD and focuses its efforts on the poorest countries in the world, and offers assistance in turning their struggling economies around. The World Bank Group consists of the IBRD, IDA, and three other institutions. The International Finance Corporation, or IFC, helps high-risk business sectors and high-risk countries obtain private sector investors. The Multinational Investment Guarantee Agency, or MIGA, offers political risk insurance to investors and lenders to encourage investment in developing countries. Finally, the International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes, or ICSID, settles disputes between foreign investors and developing countries taking the investment funds. The International Monetary Fund, commonly referred to as the IMF, was created in 1944 and currently has about 188 member countries. One goal of the IMF is to promote international cooperation on international monetary policy. Monetary policy is a country's decision regarding interest rates and money supply. The IMF also tries to encourage the expansion of international trade and promote currency exchange stability. Currency exchange rate stability means that the value of one currency in relation to another is fairly stable. Finally, the IMF helps countries meet their financial obligations. The financial account measures the differences between inflow in financial and physical assets and the outflow of financial and physical assets. A negative balance means there is more money going out of the country than coming in. The IMF can provide short-term financing if a country needs help with a negative financial account. The IMF uses primarily three different tools to accomplish its mission. First, the IMF monitors the economic developments at the global level all the way down to individual nations. It tries to figure out how the monetary and fiscal policies of individual countries affect other countries and their economies. It also analyzes economic trends from all levels, from a global perspective down to a national perspective. 
Second, the IMF also provides training and technical assistance in four areas. The IMF offers technical assistance and training regarding monetary and fiscal policies. It also offers training and assistance in fiscal policy and management, including such things as tax and customs policies, budget formulation, designing of social safety nets, and management of debt. Assistance and training is also provided for compiling, managing, and improving statistical data. Finally, the IMF will help with economic and financial legislation. Lending is the third tool that the IMF uses. The IMF provides short-term financing to help countries that need to correct their balance of payments. Remember, a negative trade balance means that there is more money leaving the country than coming into it. A current account deficit means that a country may not be able to pay its bills because it doesn't have enough currency. The IMF short-term lending can help this problem and provide funds so the country can honor its financial obligations. The aim of the lending is not to finance projects like the World Bank's lending, but to stabilize economies and restore economic growth to economies in crisis. The Bank for International Settlements, or BIS, is an international bank that is based in Switzerland. Its membership includes about 60 central banks, and it's considered the central banker's bank. A central bank is the bank in a country that is responsible for developing and implementing a country's monetary policy, which is decisions about interest rates and money supply. The BIS's primary role today is to assist its members with short-term fluctuations in currency rates and providing a forum for central bank cooperation. Let's review what we've learned. The World Bank consists of two different institutions, which are the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development and International Development Association. The World Bank's primary mission is to aid in the economic development of countries with a particular focus on middle-income and lower-income countries. The World Bank Group consists of the World Bank and three other institutions. The International Finance Corporation helps high-risk countries obtain private sector investors, while the Multinational Investment Guarantee Agency provides political risk insurance to investors. The International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes helps resolve disputes between investors and the countries receiving the investment. The International Monetary Fund's mission is to promote international cooperation regarding monetary policy, encourage the expansion of international trade and currency exchange stability. It also provides short-term financing to help countries meet their financial obligations. Remember that the World Bank provides long-term project financing and the IMF provides short-term help with financial account problems. The Bank for International Settlements is the Central Bankers Bank. Today it is primarily a forum for central bank cooperation to help create and maintain a stable international financial system. The economies of the world are at different stages of development. Some countries, such as the United States and Western European countries, have highly developed economies that have created a great amount of wealth for its citizens. Other countries, such as countries of Sub-Sahara Africa, are quite underdeveloped compared to the U.S., and large parts of their populations live in poverty. The World Bank was initially created to help with economic development. It was originally formed shortly after World War II in an effort to rebuild the economies of war-torn countries. But its mission is now global in scope. The general mission of the World Bank is to provide long-term financing for economic development. The World Bank is actually comprised of two institutions. The International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, or IBRD, which provides low-interest and no-interest loans to developing countries who cannot get financing elsewhere. The IBRD also provides technical and research assistance to developing countries. Examples of projects funded by these loans include infrastructure projects such as power plants, roads, railroads, ports, telecommunication, and water systems. Loans have also been provided for health, education, and debt relief. As you can probably see, these types of projects are foundational for further economic development. For example, if you don't have a healthy, educated population with access to roads, power, safe water, and communications, you will not have significant economic development. The IBRD has about 188 member nations, which is pretty close to every nation on the planet. A country must pay a subscription to join. Each member country gets 250 votes and can get more votes by buying shares of the IBRD at $100,000 per share. Decisions are made by majority vote, but the largest shareholders can control the outcome because they have most of the votes. The U.S. is the largest shareholder. The other part of the World Bank is the International Development Association, or IDA. The IDA was started in 1960. It works with the IBRD and focuses its efforts on the poorest countries in the world and offers assistance in turning their struggling economies around. The World Bank Group consists of the IBRD, IDA, and three other institutions. The International Finance Corporation, or IFC, helps high-risk business sectors and high-risk countries obtain private sector investors. The Multinational Investment Guarantee Agency, or MIGA, offers political risk insurance to investors and lenders to encourage investment in developing countries. Finally, the International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes, or ICSID, settles disputes between foreign investors and developing countries taking the investment funds. The International Monetary Fund, commonly referred to as the IMF, was created in 1944 and currently has about 188 member countries. One goal of the IMF is to promote international cooperation on international monetary policy. Monetary policy is a country's decision regarding interest rates and money supply.
The IMF also tries to encourage the expansion of international trade and promote currency exchange stability. Currency exchange rate stability means that the value of one currency in relation to another is fairly stable. Finally, the IMF helps countries meet their financial obligations. The financial account measures the differences between inflow in financial and physical assets and the outflow of financial and physical assets. A negative balance means there is more money going out of the country than coming in. The IMF can provide short-term financing if a country needs help with a negative financial account. The IMF uses primarily three different tools to accomplish its mission. First, the IMF monitors the economic developments at the global level all the way down to individual nations. It tries to figure out how the monetary and fiscal policies of individual countries affect other countries and their economies. It also analyzes economic trends from all levels, from a global perspective down to a national perspective. Second, the IMF also provides training and technical assistance in four areas. The IMF offers technical assistance and training regarding monetary and fiscal policies. It also offers training and assistance in fiscal policy and management, including such things as tax and customs policies, budget formulation, designing of social safety nets, and management of debt. Assistance and training is also provided for compiling, managing, and improving statistical data. Finally, the IMF will help with economic and financial legislation. Lending is the third tool that the IMF uses. The IMF provides short-term financing to help countries that need to correct their balance of payments. Remember, a negative trade balance means that there is more money leaving the country than coming into it. A current account deficit means that a country may not be able to pay its bills because it doesn't have enough currency. The IMF short-term lending can help this problem and provide funds so that a country can honor its financial obligations. The aim of the lending is not to finance projects like the World Bank's lending, but to stabilize economies and restore economic growth to economies in crisis. The Bank for International Settlements, or BIS, is an international bank that is based in Switzerland. Its membership includes about 60 central banks, and it's considered the central banker's bank. A central bank is the bank in a country that is responsible for developing and implementing a country's monetary policy, which is decisions about interest rates and money supply. The BIS's primary role today is to assist its members with short-term fluctuations in currency rates and providing a forum for central bank cooperation. Let's review what we've learned. The World Bank consists of two different institutions, which are the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development and International Development Association. The World Bank's primary mission is to aid in the economic development of countries with a particular focus on middle-income and lower-income countries. The World Bank Group consists of the World Bank and three other institutions. The International Finance Corporation helps high-risk countries obtain private sector investors, while the Multinational Investment Guarantee Agency provides political risk insurance to investors. The International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes helps resolve disputes between investors and the countries receiving the investment. The International Monetary Fund's mission is to promote international cooperation regarding monetary policy, encourage the expansion of international trade and currency exchange stability. It also provides short-term financing to help countries meet their financial obligations. Remember that the World Bank provides long-term project financing, and the IMF provides short-term help with financial account problems. The Bank for International Settlements is the Central Bankers Bank. Today, it is primarily a forum for central bank cooperation to help create and maintain a stable international financial system. Have you ever been on vacation in a foreign country and wondered about the exchange rate? For example, why is it that a Canadian dollar is just about the same as a U.S. dollar, while a U.S. dollar is worth over 12 Mexican pesos? Where do these conversion rates come from anyway? Well, just like the price of any good, exchange rates are determined on open markets under the control of two forces, demand and supply. Remember the laws of demand and supply? Demand is simply the amount of people in a market, consumers, who are willing and able to buy at different prices. Ability depends on the personal budget, and willingness reflects how much you like a product. A vegetarian will not buy any steak, no matter how low the price. The law of demand says that the quantity demanded for a good falls as the price rises, and increases as the price falls. We see this happen every year on Black Friday. So price and quantity demanded are inversely related. Therefore, the demand curve slopes downward. Supply is simply the amount of goods owners or producers offer for sale. The law of supply says that the quantity of a good supplied rises as the market price rises and falls as the price falls. In other words, price and quantity supplied are directly related. If price goes up, quantity supplied will increase. If price goes down, quantity supplied will decrease. The idea here is that when the price of something you own goes up, you're more inclined to sell it. Suppliers work the same way. If the price of a good that they produce goes up, then there is a higher incentive to sell more of that good because they can make more profit. Just like the value of a good is determined by the supply and demand for that good, the value of a nation's currency is determined by the supply and demand for that currency. For example, during the 2012 Summer Olympics in London, tourism to England increased. That could have caused an increase in demand for the British pound and the value of the pound to rise. Generally, exchange rates vary as demand for goods from nations vary. More demand for British goods, for example, would change the demand for the British pound. Just as supply and demand dictate the value of a good, supply and demand will dictate the value of the British pound as well. 
What would you do if you could buy your school books at lower prices from a supplier in England than in the U.S.? You'd probably go online and order the books from the British company and save money. But before you can buy your school books from the British supplier, you'll have to exchange your money for British pounds. Even if they accept U.S. dollars, the seller from England ultimately wants to be paid in pounds, so eventually the money will get exchanged. The better deal creates higher demand for the English currency. The demand curve for British pounds in terms of the U.S. dollar is a normal downward sloping demand curve. This is because if the value of the British pound went down relative to the U.S. dollar, the quantity of pounds demanded by Americans would increase. When pounds go on sale, more pounds are sold. Pretty much the same idea behind the demand of a good. For Americans, British goods are less expensive when the pound is cheaper and the dollar is stronger. Assuming there is only trade between the U.S. and England, when the value of the British pound goes down, Americans will switch from American-made goods to British-made goods. But before we can purchase goods made in Britain, we have to exchange dollars for British pounds. Consequently, the increased demand for British goods is simultaneously an increase in the quantity of British pounds demanded. In other words, when the price of British pounds goes down, the quantity demanded for British pounds goes up. On the flip side, the supply curve for British pounds in terms of the U.S. dollar is a normal upward-sloping supply curve. If the value of the U.S. dollar went down, people from England would want to buy more of our goods. Their demand for U.S. dollars would go up, so they would supply or exchange more of their British pounds for U.S. dollars. Thus, the supply of British pounds on the international markets increases. To summarize, as more American goods are demanded, this causes a simultaneous increase in the supply of British pounds to purchase those goods. Think of it like this. You have all the U.S. dollars in the world. The only way for someone from England to convert their pounds into dollars is to come to you and trade, so you end up with more British pounds than you had before. Effectively, the decrease in the value of the dollar has created a higher supply of pounds. From the perspective of the British, the supply curve of the British pound is really the demand curve of the U.S. dollar. Understanding how various events cause currencies to experience changes in supply and demand is very important in understanding how exchange rates change. An increase in the U.S. demand for the pound, like the example of cheaper books from England, creates a rightward shift of the demand curve and ultimately causes a rise in the exchange rate, increasing the value of the pound and decreasing the value of the dollar. This happens because you'd rather exchange your dollars and get pounds in return. Lower demand for dollars means lower value for the dollar. Higher demand for pounds means higher value of the pound. Conversely, a fall in demand would shift the demand curve left and lead to a falling pound and rising dollar. This would happen if non-British book suppliers started offering lower prices. On the supply side, an increase in the supply of pounds to the U.S. market causes a supply curve shift to the right. A new intersection for supply and demand occurs at a lower exchange rate, and the dollar appreciates against the pound because of the increased supply of pounds. You can now buy more pounds with each dollar you have. A decrease in the supply of pounds shifts the curve leftward, causing the exchange rate to rise and the dollar to depreciate. Your dollars now buy fewer pounds. Just like how the prices are determined for goods at your local grocery store, so are the prices of currencies on exchange rates. The law of supply and demand guides the value and rates for dollars, pounds, yen, pesos, and many other currencies. When individuals purchase goods from other countries or travel outside of their country's borders, they often must convert their currency into the foreign currency. As this happens, exchange rates vary just as demand for goods and services from nations vary. More demand for American goods, for example, would change the demand for the American dollar. Just like a regular demand curve for a normal good, the demand curve for individual currencies is downward sloping. If the value of a currency declines, it becomes cheaper, the quantity of that currency demanded by foreign consumers would increase, all else constant. The point at where the demand and supply curves intersect determines the market exchange rate. An increase in the demand for currency creates a rightward shift of the demand curve, ultimately causing a rise in the exchange rate and increasing the value of the currency demanded. Conversely, a fall in demand would shift the demand curve left and lead to a decline in the currency value. On the supply side, an increase in the supply of a currency will shift the supply curve to the right, ultimately creating a new intersection for supply and demand and a lower exchange rate for the currency. A decrease in the supply of a currency shifts the curve leftward, causing the exchange rate and value for the currency to rise. When you hear the terms imports and exports, you may think of some complicated and elaborate business you saw on a television show a few months back. You may simply think these terms sound dull and have little impact on your everyday life. The bottom line is that these two terms have a dramatic impact on the economy and the selection of everyday goods that you are able to purchase. When you walk into large electronic stores, you expect to see top electronic brands from across the world, not just electronics made in your neighboring states. Can you imagine if you walked into a popular electronics store and they only had two television brand choices? You would probably end up paying more money and might not even like the choices you had to choose from. These products from other countries, imports, provide more choices for you and can also help you save money. One of the biggest factors that influence imports and exports is the value of currencies between trading countries. Let's explore how the value of currencies can impact businesses and directly affect the amount of goods and services you may have to choose from when you go shopping. 
imports are goods that are produced in a foreign country but sold in a home country. When people in one country demand products from firms in another country, they must enter into another market first to buy that nation's currency. Once this currency is exchanged, they can then purchase the product. For example, if you owned a chain of dollar stores and wanted to purchase various products from large Chinese corporations, you often can't just send a check in American dollars to the companies in China. Chinese companies would want to be paid in their own currency. As a result, you would have to go into a foreign exchange market and buy the Chinese currency with the American dollars so that you could pay for your goods. When the U.S. dollar is strong, compared to many other countries' currencies, imports are less expensive. This is because every American dollar you have will buy more corresponding foreign currency. So when you go to pay the Chinese companies in their own currency, you won't have to spend as many dollars to do it. As a result, this will lead to increased demand for imported products and the currency needed to purchase them. On the other hand, if you are importing and your local currency depreciates in value or becomes weak, then the products you are importing become more expensive. It now costs you more U.S. dollars to purchase foreign currency, making those products in Japan and China more expensive. A strong dollar or currency leads to higher imports, a weak dollar or currency to lower imports. To review quickly, exports are goods that are produced in a home country but sold to foreign countries. For example, you may have a business that makes and sells your own clothing line in the U.S. In order to increase your sales, you decide to enter and market your clothes to England and Europe. All of the sales and shipments of your clothes to England and Europe are exports. So how does a strong dollar affect your export business? If you are exporting and your local currency becomes strong or appreciates in value, then your products become more expensive for your buyers in England and Europe. Since you want to be paid in U.S. dollars, they will have to exchange their pounds or euros for U.S. dollars. When your European business partners can't purchase as many dollars with their money, that makes your products more expensive. As a result, they will likely buy less of your product. When the value of the dollar depreciates or falls, your European partners can now buy more U.S. dollars with their currency, and the price of your goods seems cheaper to them. This will increase your exports and overall sales. To recap, a strong dollar decreases exports, because U.S. products seem more expensive to foreign consumers. A weak dollar increases exports because U.S. products seem cheaper to foreign consumers. Let's use another example to drive home the concept. Consider your clothing company struck a deal to sell its top jeans to a firm in Mexico City. You agreed to sell them for 25 U.S. dollars each. Assume the exchange rate is 10 pesos to the U.S. dollar. So the $25 pair of jeans would cost the Mexican importer 250 pesos, or $25 times 10 pesos. Over the next month, let's assume that the dollar appreciates against the Mexican peso to a level of 12 to 1. The $25 pair of jeans now cost the Mexican firm 300 pesos, or $25 times 12. This may force the Mexican importer to look for cheaper jeans from other firms, or maybe even from clothing companies in other countries. To summarize, how much you pay for goods, the selection of goods you have to choose from, and the success of your business and standard of living can be directly related to imports, exports, and how the price of currency affects them. When the U.S. dollar is strong compared to many other countries' currencies, imports are less expensive. This will lead to higher imports. When the dollar depreciates or is weak, this can lead to lower imports or goods purchased from foreign countries. On the other hand, a strong dollar decreases exports because U.S. products seem more expensive to foreign consumers. When foreign consumers exchange their currency for U.S. dollars, they simply can't buy as many U.S. dollars. When the dollar weakens, foreign consumers see U.S. products as cheaper, increasing demand for U.S. products. If you ever have to travel outside the United States for work, take a cruise vacation, or possibly even purchase goods online from companies based outside your country, you will want to understand exchange rates and how your money is converted into other currencies. Having a basic understanding will help make sure you get the best deal on foreign goods and ensure you know exactly how much you are paying for something when you make that purchase from an online site quoting goods in something other than dollars. An exchange rate is the rate at which one country's currency can be traded for another country's currency. They exist so countries and firms can do business with each other and pay in the appropriate currency. They also are helpful and necessary when individuals travel to other countries and have to exchange their dollars for the local foreign currency. Countries can use exchange rates in a variety of different ways. They can have fixed exchange rates, flexible exchange rates, or partially flexible exchange rates. Let's briefly define each. Fixed exchange rate. 
is an exchange rate that is set by officials and the government commits to buying and selling currencies at that fixed rate. The purpose is to keep the currency trading in a very narrow band and it can also be referred to as a pegged rate. Flexible exchange rate is an exchange rate that is set by market forces of supply and demand between different countries for each other's currencies. The demand for a country's goods, the political stability, interest rates, inflation, and many other economic factors all influence the rate. These rates between countries can vary daily. Partially flexible exchange rate is primarily set by supply and demand forces, but is sometimes influenced by the government strategically buying and selling currencies to influence the prices of their currency. Now that we know what exchange rates are, the different types, and why they exist, let's explore how they work and are used across countries. When an American company purchases goods from a Japanese company, for example, the Japanese company will often want to be paid in their own currency, which is Japanese yen. Why, you might ask? The Japanese company most likely needs their own currency so they can pay their workers and run operations inside Japan where they are located. To complete the transaction, the American company will enter into the foreign exchange market, which is a financial currency market made up of many buyers and sellers that is open nearly 24 hours a day during the week. How much will the American company pay to convert their dollars to Japanese yen? The answer depends on when the American company is ready to pay. If they are ready to pay today, they will use the spot exchange rate which is the current exchange rate. If it is a transaction in the future, it may use the forward exchange rate, which refers to an exchange rate that is quoted and traded today before delivery and payment on a specific future date. Exchange rates exist for hundreds of currencies across the globe. There is a different American dollar exchange rate for the currencies of England, Japan, China, Mexico, Brazil, France, and many other countries. For example, one US dollar may equal 0.6 British pounds. When compared to Mexico, though, the exchange rate for one U.S. dollar may equal 13 Mexican pesos. How about the Japanese yen? One U.S. dollar may equal up to 102 Japanese yen. It is almost like one yen is equal to one American cent. Why is it important to know this? Understanding the exchange rates and conversion ratios will help you decide whether a good or service may be a good deal in another country. Large international firms must constantly monitor these exchange rates with their key trading partners as this can mean large amounts of money saved or lost to their bottom line. Let's break this down to a personal example to clarify. If you are an American looking to save money and can buy the same exact pair of jeans in England for 20 pounds, in Mexico for 390 pesos, or in Japan for 3,876 yen, which one is relatively cheaper? Using the hypothetical exchange rates in the above paragraph, Let's do the math. 20 British pounds is equal to $33.33, which is 20 divided by the 0.6 conversion rate. 390 pesos is equal to 30 American dollars, which is 390 divided by the 13 conversion rate. And 3,876 yen is equal to $38, which is 3,876 divided by the conversion rate of 102. Not considering any other costs, it looks like buying those jeans in Mexico is the best deal. In summary, in order for firms or countries to do business or for you to travel abroad, an exchange rate exists that helps determine the rate at which one country's currency can be traded for another country's currency. These exchange rates can be fixed, flexible, or partially flexible. Fixed exchange rates do not fluctuate or trade in a very narrow band. Flexible and partially flexible exchange rate let the forces of supply and demand primarily determine the exchange rates. These can fluctuate daily. When a country or firm wants to exchange their own money so they can pay a foreign business partner or vendor, they must enter into the foreign exchange market, which is a financial currency market made up of many buyers and sellers and is open almost 24 hours a day during the week. A company may be quoted or pay based on the spot exchange rate, which refers to the current exchange rate, or the forward exchange rate, which refers to an exchange rate that is quoted and traded today but for delivery and payment on a specific future date. Understanding the exchange rates and conversion ratios across countries will help you decide whether a good or service may be a good deal in another country. Large international firms must constantly monitor these exchange rates with their key trading partners as this can mean large amounts of money saved or lost to their bottom line. Although the effects can take time, changes in the exchange rate can have a big impact on the economy and your own standard of living and purchasing power. There is often debate over whether a country should have a high or low exchange rate. These discussions often revolve around the current economic and political goals at the time. 
let's explore the effects of changes in the exchange rate and see how economic variables such as inflation, the trade balance, GDP, and exports and imports are affected. To review quickly, an exchange rate is the rate at which one country's currency can be traded for another country's currency. For example, in the United States, the dollar's strength is often judged in relation to other currencies, such as the Japanese yen, the Swiss franc, and the euro. When a currency appreciates, it means it is increased in value relative to another currency. Depreciates means it weakened or fell in value relative to another currency. When a dollar buys more than its equivalent in another currency, it is often labeled strong. When it buys less than its equivalent, it's weak. For example, the exchange rates as of August 2014 for the American dollar versus the Mexican peso is 13 to 1, a strong exchange rate. As of that same date, the American dollar versus the euro is 0.75 to 1, a weaker exchange rate. Do you like your money to go further when you make purchases? How about the ability to have more choices when you go shopping? When a currency appreciates or strengthens a higher exchange rate, there are many effects on you and the economy. Some good, some not so good. Let's discuss a few of those now. Imports cheaper. When a currency appreciates or strengthens in relation to other currencies, imports get cheaper. This means your dollar will buy more of another foreign currency so that you can purchase foreign goods. For example, if you were traveling and shopping in Europe and the exchange rate of the dollar versus the euro went from 0.75 to 1 to 0.95 to 1, your dollars would now buy more euros. So if a can of soda cost 2 euros, it would have originally cost you $2.66, which is 2 divided by the 0.75 exchange rate. Now it costs you essentially $2.11, $2 divided by the 0.95 exchange rate. This is also great news for American companies who import a lot of components and raw materials to manufacture goods. Lower costs often lead to higher profit margins. Lower inflation. When the exchange rate for a currency strengthens, it makes imports cheaper. This means you and I spend less money on foreign goods. This in turn puts pressure on American firms to keep their prices low so they can remain competitive. All of this leads to lower prices and ultimately more money in your pocket and a higher standard of living. Balance of trade deficit. One of the biggest disadvantages of higher exchange rates or a strong dollar may be that it leads to trade deficits. Because strong currencies lead to cheaper imports, a country tends to import more than they export. This causes a trade deficit, which can exert a contractionary effect on the economy. What does that mean? It simply means that because our currency is strong, our own goods we look to export appear expensive to other countries, so they buy fewer American goods. This lowers demand for American goods and as a result lowers GDP. Over time, this can make it more difficult for American firms to compete and can also damage profit potential. A lower or weak exchange rate can have the opposite effect as strong exchange rate or currency. Let's discuss those now. Imports more expensive. If the dollar or your own currency declines, this erodes the value of your personal finances. You now have to spend more dollars to buy foreign currencies so that you can purchase foreign goods. Traveling outside your home country just got more expensive. Increased inflation. Higher import prices by foreign firms also give domestic firms the ability to raise or charge higher prices at home. As a result, inflation can increase which continues to erode the value of your cash holdings. Balance of trade surplus. On the other hand, a weak dollar or currency can help exports. Foreign countries can now purchase more dollars with their own currency, so they demand more American goods. As a result, American firms manufacture and sell more products, leading to more profits. This can strengthen the economy and increase job growth over time. All of this can lead to a balance of trade surplus, or at least narrow the trade deficit. In summary, the effects of changes in the exchange rate can be both good and bad. Whether they are positive or negative often may depend on your own individual situation and view of the economy. A strong dollar or increase in the exchange rate is often better for individuals because it makes imports cheaper and lowers inflation. This gives individuals more purchasing power in the world marketplace. This often leads to a better standard of living. Over time though, the strong currency can lead to fewer exports by American firms and a balance of trade deficit. This can weaken an economy and eventually lead to job loss. A weak currency or lower exchange rate can be better for an economy and for firms that export goods to other countries. This can help during times of slow growth or when an economy is coming out of a recession. The weak dollar means foreign countries and individuals can now purchase more American currency with less of their currency. This encourages exports by American firms and can lead to more profits and higher job growth over time.
The disadvantage of a lower exchange rate is that it can cause imports to be more expensive and can result in higher inflation. Many of us would agree that we want to live in a country that is competitive and has a good standard of living compared to other countries around us. Many of us would also probably like the option to buy relatively cheap foreign products for our everyday use. Most economists would also agree that one of the primary international goals of macroeconomic policy is to maintain the position of the U.S. as one of the leaders in the world economy. But how does one measure all of this? That is where the debate begins. Some believe a balance of trade deficit or surplus is the key measurement. Other economists might argue that we should look at the value of the exchange rate. This lesson will focus on the exchange rate and how fiscal and monetary policies can affect it and the prices we pay for goods every day. To review, an exchange rate is simply the rate at which one country's currency can be traded or exchanged for another country's currency. It determines how cheap or how expensive it is for you to buy goods such as televisions, clothes, and tires for your car. A high exchange rate for the U.S. dollar makes foreign currencies cheaper, which lowers the price of imports. This means you can buy more electronics and other goods and services for every dollar you make. A low exchange rate makes imports more expensive because your dollar won't buy as much foreign currency. Although this means you will spend more of your paycheck on normal everyday items, on the flip side it encourages exports, which can cause a balance of trade surplus and help the economy grow. Now that we have recapped a few of the basics, let's dive deeper into how fiscal and monetary policy affect the exchange rate. Fiscal policy, which is the use of government spending or taxes to grow or slow down the economy, can affect the exchange rate in three different ways. It can affect exchange rates through income changes, price changes, and interest rates. Let's explore each now. Income changes. When the government lowers your taxes through fiscal policy, it puts more income in your pocket. This means more shopping and morning stops at the local coffee shop, usually resulting in overall increased demand for goods and services. This means more imports. You have more money, you want to spend it. The rise in imports results in U.S. citizens selling more dollars to buy foreign currencies to pay for those imported goods. This decreases the dollar exchange rate, ultimately leading to more expensive products in the future. Price changes. When the government wants to grow the economy, it is known as expansionary policy. To do this, the government can reduce taxes or spend more to stimulate the economy. When the government spends more or decides to cut your tax bill, this ultimately leads to increased demand, which pushes the overall price of goods and services higher. As the prices of goods increases, this also makes exports of our goods to other countries more expensive and imports more attractive. This leads to higher demand for foreign currency to buy goods and lower demand for dollars to purchase U.S. goods. This lowers the exchange rate. Contractionary policy, which is characterized by a decrease in government spending or increases in taxes, has the opposite effect. Interest rates. Now that we have seen how income and price levels can affect the exchange rates, let's see how interest rates work. When the government takes an expansionary fiscal approach and wants to increase its spending, it has to get that money from somewhere. To do that, it sells bonds, which raises the interest rates. This higher U.S. interest rate causes foreign dollars to flow into the United States because foreign investors are attracted to the higher interest rates, which give them a better return on their money. People are always looking for a good return on their money. This increased flow of capital pushes up the U.S. exchange rate. On the contrary, contractionary fiscal policy leads to lower interest rates and more capital flowing out of the U.S. and pushes down the exchange rate. Monetary policy. Monetary policy, which is headed by the Federal Reserve and involves changing the money supply and credit availability to individuals can also affect the exchange rates. Similar to fiscal policy, it can affect the exchange rates through three paths. Income, prices, and interest rates. Income. Monetary policy acts in much the same way as fiscal policy in relation to income. When the money supply rises or credit gets easier, for example your ability to get a loan, the income in your pocket increases. As our pocketbooks get bigger, we spend more money on imports. As we sell dollars to buy foreign currencies so we can pay for those exciting new goods, this decreases the dollar exchange rate. On the other hand, contractionary monetary policy, which leads to lower money supply or tighter credit, causes U.S. income to fall. This leads to fewer imports, less demand for foreign currency, and a rising U.S. exchange rate. Prices. When the Federal Reserve wants to expand the economy, it pumps more money into the economy. More money in the economy leads to higher demand for goods and services, which increases the prices you pay. Similar to the income path, this rise in prices makes exports more expensive and imports relatively cheaper. 
When imports become cheaper, we buy more imports. This increases our demand for foreign currencies to pay for these goods and pushes down the exchange rate. Interest rates. Although the income and price path act very similar for both monetary and fiscal policy, the interest rate path is just the opposite when comparing the two. When interest rates are lowered through monetary policy to help boost the economy, this lowers the amount of capital that flows into the United States. Foreign investors can't earn a very good return. This decreases the demand for U.S. dollars and decreases the U.S. exchange rate. On the other hand, contractionary monetary policy or an increase in interest rates would have the opposite effect. For example, if someone in China was only earning 2% on their money at home, but knew they could invest their money in financial instruments in the United States and earn 6% instead, this would push up the demand for dollars in the U.S. and increase the value of the dollar and the U.S. exchange rate. In summary, in order to do business with other countries, we often have to change our currency into the form of currency that the foreign country uses. An exchange rate helps us do that and is what determines how much foreign currency might cost us if we were to exchange our dollars to buy imports or invest overseas. Both fiscal and monetary policy can each affect the exchange rates in three different ways. The three paths are through income changes, price changes, and interest rates. When the government or Federal Reserve use monetary or fiscal policy to expand the economy, this increases our income and our demand for imports, and ultimately lowers the exchange rate. Contractionary policies have the opposite effect. Likewise, an expansionary approach to fiscal or monetary policy can result in an increase in demand for goods and services. This leads to higher prices domestically and relatively cheaper imports. All of this lowers the value of the dollar or decreases the exchange rate as more people exchange or demand foreign currencies to pay for goods. Although the income and price paths act very similar for monetary and fiscal policy, the interest rate path acts differently depending on whether fiscal or monetary policy is used. When the government takes an expansionary fiscal approach, this increases interest rates because the government has to sell bonds to raise the money it wants to spend. In turn, this attracts foreign capital and the demand for dollars and ultimately increases the exchange rate. On the other hand, when the Federal Reserve takes an expansionary monetary policy approach through lower interest rates, this incents money to flow out of the country seeking better returns. This decreases Unlike reading tea leaves, forecasting exchange rates employs analytical principles to determine future rates. Traders may play the foreign currency exchanges, much as an investor would work with stocks and bonds. Investors are also interested in the exchange rates if they want to invest in other countries. Investing in those countries requires knowledge of the currency or currencies involved. We can never fully predict the stock market or foreign exchange rates. None of the methods we'll mention are 100%, nor are they expected to be. However, investors would prefer data to back up their decisions. Purchasing power parity, or PPP, is a commonly used method based on the theory of the law of one price. This law of one price states that identical goods should have identical prices, regardless of country. A Coca-Cola in Thailand should cost the same as a Coke in the U.S., after accounting for exchange rates and shipping. PPP also accounts for inflation from country to country. If Thai prices are expected to go up by 3%, and U.S. prices by only 1%, the inflation difference is 2%. Thai prices will go up faster than U.S. prices. Therefore, the PPP approach forecasts that the Thai bot would need to depreciate by about 2% to maintain parity. One Thai bot equals 3 cents. Therefore, 1 plus 0 0.02 times 3 cents U.S. per one Thai bot equals 3.09 cents U.S. per one Thai bot. The relative economic strength approach is less precise than the PPP method. It's more of a general assessment of a country's currency rates. The relative economic strength approach looks to the economic growth in a given country to determine the strength of the health of a country. If an economy is stronger, you can make a fairly good assumption that this growth will attract investors. In order to buy investments, you need to buy that country's currency. This should create an increase in demand, thus bumping up the currency rate. High interest rates would also be a good sign for investors, also causing the currency to rise. The idea of econometric models can get very complicated, since they're based on economic theory. Basically, you pick an economic factor that would affect currency, then create a model based on it. That, in the most basic essence, is an econometric model. Let's say we decide that GDP growth rates and interest rates are economic indicators. We can define a model that might look like this. USD over THB equals Z plus A times GDP plus B times INT. Don't worry about the nitty-gritty details of the model. These can get very complicated very fast. The key idea is that the variables INT and GDP are impacted by the coefficients A and B. These items affect the exchange rate, either positive or negative. This is by far the most complex model, but it does allow us to factor in more variables. 
The time series model is a model that analyzes past performance as a means to predict future events. You can plug in the past seven years of the bot's history and then map out a model for future performance. A trader or investor could take the chart here and predict future results. Right now, the graph stops at month 45, but it could be extended based on the past ups and downs. This could be done in Excel to calculate moving averages. All right, let's take a moment or two to review. Traders and investors need to have methods for predicting foreign exchange rates, whether they intend to invest in a country or to trade in foreign exchange markets. Having solid predictive data is important. The four methods for forecasting foreign exchange rates are as follows. Purchasing power parity, or PPP, which is an idea that is built upon the premise that a good in one country should have an equal price in another, considering exchange rates and inflation. Relative economic strength, which analyzes the economic environment in a country to determine possible future currency rates. Economic models, which can be very complex since they input one or many economic factors that could impact exchange rates. And finally, the time series model, which plots past performance and maps out a future model and predicted behavior. Every country has a set of characteristics such as natural resources and skilled manpower that can influence their ability to build their economy. These are known as the economic factors or the conditions of the economic environment within a country, which are a country's current economic condition and available economic resources that influence their capacity to further develop their economy. In other words, economic development or the process that increases a country's average standard of living by further enhancing the economy can be affected by the current and available economic conditions. While economic factors are not the only thing influencing economic development, they are important for understanding the capacity or the ability of the economy to develop on their own. Important economic factors include natural resources, power and energy resources, capital accumulation, technological resources, available labor force, transportation and communications, education and training. Each of these factors influences the available economic resources and growth opportunities within a country. Natural resources are the physical resources naturally available within a country. This includes trees, soil, water, minerals, coal, oil, and anything else existing within a country. Natural resources can help countries develop by creating jobs and increasing their wealth through the sales. The value of natural resources depends on the international interest in the resources. For example, oil is one resource known for making countries wealthy. This is because oil is in high demand and there are fears that it is running out. Despite the benefit of natural resources, they are limited and will eventually run out. Thus, countries can use them to boost their development, but they can't depend on them to maintain the future of their economy. Power and energy resources include natural and man-made resources that produce power or energy. Natural resources that produce power and energy, such as oil, gas, and water, are of particular value because they serve a dual purpose of being natural, which can be mined and sold relatively quickly, and they are important for producing power and energy within the country, which is essential for all nations to operate within the global economy. Man-made power and energy resources such as nuclear power, electricity, and solar power are necessary for industrializing and modernizing a country. This power enhances the farming and industrial capabilities with a country. Further, available power increases the quality of life within a nation. Capital accumulation or financial profits and investments acquired by a country influence its ability to pay wages and hire labor. The more capital a country has, the more jobs it can create. In contrast, low capital countries may have a low living wage and high unemployment. Technological resources refers to the use of and ability to use advanced technologies within a country. This includes computers, cell phones, and other devices which increase business capabilities and the quality of life. Countries with low technological resources are not prepared to play an active role in the global economy because they either don't have the technology or they don't know how to use it. Available labor force considers the number of skilled laborers within the country and the need for laborers. A discrepancy in either education or number of needed laborers can cause harm to an economy. For example, too many laborers and not enough work means high unemployment. Too few laborers and too much work means there will be a lack of efficiency and inability to support the economy's outputs. Transportation and communications includes a country's available transportation systems including air, train, car, and road, and their available communication systems such as phone lines, the internet, radio, and television. Transportation is important for moving around the country to get to jobs and for industrializing cities. It is also important for transporting goods across the country. Communication makes it possible for a country to communicate within itself and with other nations, which is important for establishing strong businesses that can build the economy. Education and Training The quality and availability of education and training provided to the citizens within a nation. This builds the capacity of the labor force and it can nurture entrepreneurs who will assist in building the economy. Thus, better education and training are important for societies to grow and expand their economies. Like all factors influencing economic development, none of the economic factors act alone. Each factor is interacting with one another and influencing the overall ability of the country to develop. 
Economic factors refer to the economic conditions available and within a country that influences their ability to develop. This means that economic development, or the process that increases the standard of living in a country by moving from agricultural and rural-based societies to more industrialized nations, is influenced by the current economic conditions within a country. Economic factors have an important influence on the capacity or the ability of the country to develop. These factors include Natural resources, the available but limited physical resources naturally existing within a country, such as water, trees, gas, oil, soil, and minerals. Power and energy resources, the natural or man-made resources that provide power and energy. Natural power and energy resources include water, gas, and oil, while the man-made resources include nuclear power, solar power, and electricity. Capital accumulation, the available financial resources and investments of the country that influence its ability to create jobs and pay living wages. Technological resources, the use of and ability to use advanced technologies. This means having new technologies and the ability of citizens to take advantage of the technology. Available labor force, the number of trained laborers of working age and the number of needed laborers. Transportation and communications, the quality and availability of a transportation system within a country and its ability to communicate between cities and other nations. Education and training. The quality and availability of education and training that can enhance the capacity of the workforce and nurture potential entrepreneurs. Each factor influences a country's ability to economically develop. However, the factors do not act alone. They are interacting with one another and with other factors such as socio-cultural norms and a country's political system. Every society has a set of values, beliefs, traditions, and habits known as their socio-cultural values. These values shape how we approach risk how we view careers, our perception of money, and our ideas of an ideal lifestyle. Because of this, socio-cultural values are one of many interacting factors that can impact economic development within a country. Economic development is when a society shifts from traditional, agricultural-based living standards into an industrialized and business-driven society. For example, the Industrial Revolution and the move from farming to factory jobs. In general, economic development is associated with a higher quality of life and an overall increase in the standard of living. Because socio-cultural values influence how we, as people in society, interact with the world, they also influence how we approach the process of economic development. Some socio-cultural values that can impact economic development include materialism and post-materialism, collectivism and individualism, innovation, religion, obedience, thrift, and risk propensity. Materialism is the tendency to place greater value on physical needs or belongings than quality of life and spirituality. Post-materialism places greater value on spiritual well-being, quality of life, and relationships. Societies high in materialism are most likely to seek greater economic development in order to have more physical belongings. In contrast, post-materialist societies focus on enjoying the life available to them. Importantly, post-materialist societies are most likely to be identified in countries that are already developed and their material needs have been met. Collectivism is a value that leads people to act for the greater good of the entire population while individualism suggests that people should make decisions for their own benefit, since maximizing individual happiness is the best way to maximize societal happiness. In collectivist societies, activities that lead to economic development should benefit the majority, if not all, of the population. However, in individualist societies, one person is concerned about their own satisfaction and economic development, often with little or no regard for the well-being of the greater society. Innovation considers how interested a culture is in progress. Cultures high on innovation are excited and interested in new technologies, changes to society, and ultimately economic growth. In contrast, cultures low on innovation may be fearful or hesitant to implement anything new into their society. The values taught within religion influence how individuals approach everyday activities. In turn, these values and beliefs can influence personal decisions on work, business ventures, and industrialization. Obedience refers to how much citizens conform to the social norms and expectations. High obedience means that decisions made are in line with the cultural norms, and people are discouraged from doing anything outside of these norms. Thrift, or frugality, refers to how much the culture saves money and sees value in saving money. Some cultures are focused on saving and not spending, while others are more interested in investment and making profit. Because economic development requires both saving and spending, the level of thrift and practices of spending within the culture can have an important impact on further development. And finally, risk propensity is the level of risk an individual is naturally inclined to accept. Cultures high in risk propensity are more likely to accept the unknown, such as a new business venture, than those low in risk propensity. Imagine that Timmy comes from a culture high in risk propensity. In general, his society believes it's better to take risks and lose than to never try. Timmy is presented with the opportunity to join a new business venture. He takes the risk, and the business is successful. 
As a result, the local economy has improved, and Timmy has helped to create hundreds of jobs. In contrast, Jay comes from a culture low in risk propensity. In his culture, risk-taking is viewed as greedy and irresponsible. When presented with the same opportunity as Timmy, he politely declines the offer. The economy stays the same, and there is no additional economic development. It's important to keep in mind that socio-cultural values interlink with one another. For example, the level of materialism interacts with the level of obedience, innovation, and individualism. Further, just because a culture has low risk propensity does not mean that there won't be economic growth. There are many factors influencing economic growth. However, these values do play an important role in the process of development. All right, let's take a moment to review the important information that we learned in this lesson about socio-cultural values and the different examples of each. Socio-cultural values are the beliefs, values, traditions, and habits that influence our everyday behavior. These values influence the decisions we make and actions we take. Because of this, socio-cultural values can have an important impact on economic development. Economic development is a societal progression from agricultural-based living to an industrialized society. It generally increases the quality of life and overall living standard within a society. Socio-cultural values influence economic development by influencing how people in society interact with the process of development. These values include risk propensity, which is the amount of risk the general population is willing to accept. Materialism, which is when value is placed on obtaining physical belongings, and post-materialism, which occurs where emphasis is placed on the quality of life. Collectivism, which is when people do things for the greater good of the entire population. And individualism, which is when the focus is on individual success, even at the expense of greater society. Innovation, which is the level of comfort towards advancement and change within a society. Religion, which instills values and beliefs that influence behavior. This ultimately has an influence on the overall population. Obedience, which is the tendency of members in a society to follow or obey social norms. And finally, thrift, which is the spending habits and social norms towards saving or using money. All societal norms interact with one another. This means that risk propensity is influenced by obedience, and obedience is influenced by religion, and so on. Furthermore, each norm differs between societies, regions, countries, and even cities within a country, which is why there is so much diversity between nations. How a country operates can have a dramatic impact on the development within a country. The government-enforced policies and administrative norms known as political factors can influence economic development, which is the process that increases standard of living by moving away from traditional farming cultures to industrialized societies. In general, political factors influence economic development by supporting or disrupting the process of development. Political factors that tend to have an important impact on economic development include regime type, political stability or instability, policy management, corruption, and trade laws. Regime type is the form of government within a country. This includes whether a country is democratic, authoritarian, communist, or other. The regime type influences the policies that affect personal and public economic development. For example, in a democratic nation, people are able to obtain small business loans and start their own company. The business is able to expand exponentially and pay employees different rates depending on the work they are doing. However, in a communist nation, there are strict regulations such as paying all staff equally, which can impact how businesses operate and prevent growth that would increase economic development. Political stability or instability refers to the reliability and durability of a government's structures. The more stable a political system is, the less risk a business operating in that country will face. Nations where there is a high risk of terrorism or internal conflicts are less stable. This makes opening and operating a business expensive and risky in the region. When a country goes to war, this decreases business and it can harm the quality of the currency exchange rate or the amount the country's money is worth when compared to that of other nations. Thus, less stable systems are less likely to see an increase in economic development because they are risky to operate in. Political management refers to how well the government monitors and enforces national and international policies or laws. Countries where copyright and piracy laws are not enforced are less desirable for businesses to operate in. Failure to enforce copyright or piracy laws means that a company may not make money and, in turn, this increases the risk of operating in the region. For example, a company that wants to sell music may change their mind because this won't be profitable. Everyone will illegally download the music for free. Level of corruption identifies the level of dishonest, unethical, and illegal practices that are imposed on people and businesses operating in a region. Corruption can include bribing politicians, bribing local companies for materials, or paying to prevent competitors from entering the market. Imagine that a company pays the government to keep a competitor out. This prevents further economic development and can cause a monopoly that makes services overly expensive. Trade laws are the local and international policies that impact the importation or exportation of goods. 
Trade laws are a political factor because governments and politicians develop the policies regarding trade. Trade includes tariffs or fees and taxes imposed on certain imports and exports. Some trade deals between countries can reduce trade tariffs. However, this often occurs between two developed nations and undeveloped or developing economies face high taxes that can prevent them from participating in international trade. Each political factor can influence the process of economic development in a country. However, the factors do not act alone. They are constantly interacting with one another and other factors that influence economic development, including socio-cultural norms, economics, and administrative factors. Political factors or government policies and administrative practices can have a great impact on economic development, which is the movement from farming-based cultures to industrialized societies. In general, economic development increases the standard of living in a country. Political factors influence economic development by positively or negatively influencing the process of development. Some important political factors include regime type, which is the form of government operating in a country. Whether a country is democratic, authoritarian, or communist can influence the policies developed and the restrictions imposed on businesses operating in the region. Political stability refers to the integrity and sturdiness of a country. Nations experiencing or at risk for war, terrorism, or internal conflict are difficult and risky for businesses to operate in. Political instability can decrease business sales and it can damage the currency exchange rate, which is the amount the local cash is worth when compared to that of other nations. Political management is how well local and international policies and laws are monitored and enforced. When countries do not properly manage certain laws, such as copyright laws, it can decrease the profitability of a company and ultimately their desire to operate in that region. Level of corruption refers to the honesty and ethical practices of a country. This includes bribery, dishonest methods to prevent competition, and other practices that can harm the process of economic development in a country. Trade laws are national and international policies on the importation or exportation of goods. This includes tariffs or increased taxes on certain imports or exports. One problem is that trade deals that decrease tariffs often occur between developed nations. This can prevent undeveloped and developing nations from playing an active and competitive role in international trade. Each political factor influences the process of economic development within a country. It's important to note that political factors do not act alone. They interact with one another and with other factors that influence economic development, such as socio-cultural norms, economics, and administrative influences. Foreign Direct Investment, FDI, is an investment in a business by an investor from another country, for which the foreign investor has control over the company purchased. The Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, defines control as owning 10% or more of the business. Businesses that make foreign direct investments are often called multinational corporations, MNCs, or multinational enterprises, MNEs. A MNE may make a direct investment by creating a new foreign enterprise, which is called a greenfield investment, or by the acquisition of a foreign firm, either called an acquisition or brownfield investment. In the context of foreign direct investment, advantages and disadvantages are often a matter of perspective. An FDI may provide some great advantages for the MNE, but not for the foreign country where the investment is made. On the other hand, sometimes the deal can work out better for the foreign country depending upon how the investment pans out. Ideally, there should be numerous advantages for both the MNE and the foreign country, which is often a developing country. We'll examine the advantages and disadvantages from both perspectives, starting with the advantages for multinational enterprises, MNEs. Access to markets. FDI can be an effective way for you to enter into a foreign market. Some countries may extremely limit foreign company access to their domestic markets. Acquiring or starting a business in the market is a means for you to gain access. Access to resources. FDI is also an effective way for you to acquire important natural resources, such as precious metals or fossil fuels. Oil companies, for example, often make tremendous FDIs to develop oil fields. Reduces cost of production. FDI is a means for you to reduce your cost of production if the labor market is cheaper and the regulations are less restrictive in the target foreign market. For example, it's a well-known fact that the shoe and clothing industries have been able to drastically reduce their cost of production by moving operations to developing countries. FDI also offers some advantages for foreign countries. For starters, FDI offers a source of external capital and increased revenue. It can be a tremendous source of external capital for a developing country, which can lead to economic development. For example, if a large factory is constructed in a small developing country, the country will typically have to utilize at least some local labor, equipment, and materials to construct it. This will result in new jobs and foreign money being pumped into the economy. Once the factory is constructed, the factory will have to hire local employees and will probably utilize at least some local materials and services.
This will create further jobs and maybe even some new businesses. These new jobs mean that locals have more money to spend, thereby creating even more jobs. Additionally, tax revenue is generated from the products and activities of the factory. Taxes imposed on factory employee income and purchases. And taxes on the income and purchases now possible because of the added economic activity created by the factory. Developing governments can use this capital infusion and revenue from economic growth to create and improve its physical and economic infrastructure, such as building roads, communication systems, educational institutions, and subsidizing the creation of new domestic industries. Another advantage is the development of new industries. Remember that an MNE doesn't necessarily own all of the foreign entity. Sometimes a local firm can develop a strategic alliance with a foreign investor to help develop a new industry in the developing country. The developing country gets to establish a new industry and market, and the MNE gets access to a new market through its partnership with a local firm. Finally, learning is an indirect advantage for foreign countries. FDI exposes national and local governments, local businesses and citizens to new business practices, management techniques, economic concepts and technology that will